on the Zero Hour. I'm your host, Richard R.J. Escow. There is a war on the mind underway in this country, and it takes many forms. It includes, of course, what you've probably heard about Governor Ron DeSantis and his uh, alterations to the school curriculums there, but it also appears in debates about higher education and in actions taken in the area of higher education. The latest uh, big story in that area uh, are the uh, changes and cutbacks underway at uh, WVU, West Virginia University, uh, and here to talk about that with us now is Maya Helm. I read a number of articles about the situation at WVU, and I found Maya's to be the broadest, the uh, clearest, and the one that most effectively put it in context. Uh, you can find it at Slate Magazine. A little bit about my guest. Maya Helm is a, a black labor historian. She was a Marshall Scholar in 2022. She's now based, she's from West Virginia, but she's now based in the United Kingdom. I believe she is a first generation college graduate, but she'll tell us. She's now a PhD student at the Cardiff University School of History, Archaeology, and religion and her article in Slate magazine has, has the headline, everyone at West Virginia University knew something was up. I hate that we were right. So first of all, Maya Helm, welcome to the program. Thank you, thank you for having me. I really appreciate uh, being able to join you today. Yeah, well, we're so glad you could. And uh, so tell us, for those of us who don't know, uh, a little bit about what's going on at, at WVU. So West Virginia University, West Virginia's flagship land grant university uh, is rushing to eliminate 9% of its majors, which makes up 32 programs in total, all foreign language programs and 16% of full-time faculty members, which makes up 169 individuals in total in response to a $45 million budget deficit for the fiscal year 2024. And so, what we, you know, what struck me about uh, the the so-called you know budget-driven cuts at uh, at WVU number one, as you point out, something like uh, foreign uh, language program there, the foreign languages uh, system. I, I, it's called World Languages, Literatures, and Linguistics. You got your Arabic studies minor there. Makes an average annual profit of eight hundred thousand. So that suggests to me uh, that maybe there's some something other than strictly financial concerns involved. I don't know to what extent exactly these cuts address liberal arts majors versus business or engineering or that type of thing. Uh, roughly, what was the distribution there? Um, so we had both you have both humanities programs and non-humanities programs included in these cuts. Um, one notable uh, program that is slated to be cut are all graduate mathematics programs at West Virginia University, which currently uh, house all of the graduate um, teachers that teach math programs that are necessary for all of the STEM programs to continue to succeed at West Virginia University. And so if those are cut, you have further uh, cuts that will need to be made in the future because these programs won't be able to sustain themselves. Yeah. And what about uh, programs that aren't being cut? Is there any kind of pattern there? Uh, so it seems some of the programs that aren't being cut uh, tend to produce uh, people to be able to go into careers that are more uh, toward tech. Uh, and that benefit the tech industry, um, which has been looked at by a number of different people um, because there is a group called RPK Group um, that is providing consultancy to West Virginia University, which informs these cuts. Um, and it seems as though RPK Group has made similar recommendations at other universities in the past, um, wherein the programs that have survived have been those that benefit the tech industry. So, in other words, it sounds as if the choices are being made in a way that reinforces the kind of oligopolic or billionaire-driven 
economic trends we've seen in terms of Silicon Valley and their preferences and so on, it seems as if you know the role of a public university, in my opinion anyway, should be to promote uh, programs and careers and, and students uh, whose education will resist inequality and further democratize the economy, the political system, and so on. It seems to me when you have cuts that address uh, liberal arts programs and then a theoretical program like mathematics, but emphasize, you know, kind of feeder system for the uh, tech industry, it, it almost, uh, it, correct me, it, you know, if you disagree or if you think I'm off base, it almost seems as if these are choices made more to reinforce the uh, the form of inequality we've been seeing in the recent decades than it is to challenge it. I agree. I think that's entirely correct. Um, and I believe as well that public universities, especially public research universities, built America's educated middle class. Uh, and what we are watching today is the growing inclination toward adopting educational principles aimed at making people more adaptable, more cooperative, and more docile. Uh, and it seems as though the West Virginia University administration um, wants poor people to be so busy trying to survive that we don't have time to think. And so we don't have time to question the decisions that they're making, which they say are in our best interests. But in reality, we know that they're not. So let's talk a little bit about that, because you were a student there. You, uh, you know, you, uh, you had a sense of the student community. You were involved. And I know uh, I basically got the sense that you guys, you all knew uh, something was up. You knew something like this was coming or, you know, the kind of buzz or rumors, or whatever. Uh, tell me about that. What were the signs that something like this was coming down the road? Well, um, as a member of the Student Government Association at West Virginia University, we often spoke about uh, President WV President Gordon Gee's track record, uh, which reveals a disgusting pattern of utilizing public funds for his personal benefit. Uh, as I detailed in my Slate article, his re expense report uh, at OSU, where he was the president, uh, revealed that the university spent $7.7 .7 million on his expenses, almost equaling his $8.6 million salary. When he was president at Brown, the university spent $3 million renovating his home. Under his supervision as chancellor at Vanderbilt, Vanderbilt spent $6 million renovating the mansion where Guy lived. And Guy also incurred a $700,000 tab for hosting social events. Um, and his repeated appointments seemed to stem from his willingness to carry out the directives of affluent board members with political affiliations alongside the unfortunate absence of faculty government. Even in 2018, while he was president of West Virginia University, the Charleston Gazette Mail reported that Guy spent more than $2.2 million between May 2014 and June 2017 in private air travel that was paid for with West Virginia University tuition money. And at the time, he defended the use of his of the tuition money as perfectly legitimate. Um, and these patterns, it, they really showed massive disregard for um, providing West Virginians with quality education uh, and making sure that what we are paying um, for is not what we're getting. You know, my I have to say, when I was reading your article and I saw that piece about uh, his prior job, we're talking about President E. Gordon G., his prior job having a salary of 8.9 million to begin with, even before the 7.7 .7 or whatever million in expenses, I thought it was a typo. I thought it, that can't, I'm, it, you know, something must be missing, like it was for him and his whole staff, or, or it was 890,000, which would be a lot, uh, but 8.9 million. I mean, uh, do we know what he's making at West Virginia University? Uh, right now at West Virginia University, he's making around $800,000 per year. Which is a also a lot, a really lot. And it seems to me, and you make this point very well in your piece, that if your job is to 
figure out the trends and demographic shifts in your state and what people are going to need and and all your projections are based on information that this is me talking now so you, you know a lot more than me but my impression utterly disregard the fact that there has been a, a, a consistent decline in population as i understand it west virginia we could go on you know multiple things but then just say gosh i didn't see it coming you know i'm kind of old school in that it's like oh, what do we pay you eight hundred thousand dollars for then that's your job uh am i being unfair to the guy not at all i mean he is receiving public funds to be able to do a job that he does not do and west virginia university has a responsibility to deliver quality education to west virginians those that live in in one of the most disadvantaged states in the United States. And it's imperative to maintain oversight of administrative spending like this. Uh, and West Virginians have been asking themselves for a very long time, who does this benefit? And who does WVU leadership see themselves beholden to? Because we have, we have seen that it's not their faculty, it's not their staff, and it's not their students. It's not colleagues at other institutions, around the United States, and it's not national academic organizations, and it's not even the data that they're providing themselves. So, so who is it? And the way I see it, there is absolutely no accountability here, and their only loyalties are to themselves. And right now, it looks like no one is going to stop them, um, and that's what's scary in all of this. You know, I'm not a West Virginian. I was, was not a WVU student or a faculty member or anything else, but this makes me really mad and it, it, for a couple reasons. And uh, you know, soon I want to kind of broaden out the context of this a little bit and what it, what it can teach the rest of the country. But, but my, I'm so glad you mentioned as a historian uh, that this was a land grant university established by the Morrill Act in 1862 because the land grant universities, leaving aside land that was taken from native peoples and so on, which we should not forget, but, but in the context of this conversation, the federal government set land aside to create universities for the purpose of benefiting the people who live there. That's my understanding of the Morrill Act. And so, in effect, you have a university that exists only because the government wanted to serve the then current and future people of West Virginia. So to me, to manage it in this way, to handle it in this way, to determine that West Virginians uh, don't need to uh, study or do research in advanced mathematics or th that there are certain fields of study that West Virginians are not entitled to learn is to uh, violate. I mean, I know land grant colleges were and universities were originally in, uh, uh, focused on agriculture and so on, but, but the underlying intent was to benefit the people there. And it seems to me that means the university, any public university, but especially a land grant university, was created with an ethical mission to the people of the state. And it seems to me, I, I haven't heard anything yet that says to me decisions are being made with that ethical standard in mind. That's true. WV was entrusted with educating neglected rural students who generally do not have access to exclusive private universities because those private universities prioritize tuition revenue and privilege legacy applicants. As a West Virginian, as a Pell Grant recipient, and as a first generation college graduate, I would not have had these opportunities without West Virginia University, much less being able to leave West Virginia at all. West Virginians have been telling me they've felt shackled to the state for however many decades. Um, and the historical record shows that as well. And many of the programs potentially facing the acts at WVU are those that grant students the greatest possibility for socioeconomic mobility. And without them, what are West Virginians to do? We have nowhere to go. We have no one to turn. And again, it seems like there is no one coming to help us. Well, and, and I want to get to that in a second, but, uh, you know, I want to talk a little bit about, and I want to talk about education programs, because, I mean, 
of everything to, to cut. But you know, we'll get to that. But but I want to start um, maybe the next phase of our conversation, Maya, by saying I see. Uh, you know, maybe I'm seeing things through my own political lens or whatever, but I see ideology at work here. When you have something like a foreign language program, you got your Arabic studies minor through the foreign language program being cut, even though it brings money into the university. And there's supposedly this is all because of a financial crisis uh, that alone strikes me as an ideological choice maybe even a xenophobic choice uh that uh, you know why do we need to teach uh you know the poor and rural people of west virginia how to speak other languages they don't need that and you know we don't need to make this place more hospitable for immigrants whatever it might be i rightly or not i i get an ideological vibe for lack of a better word from a decision like that you think i'm being unfair no, I completely agree with you. And I, I've been saying, and it's been echoing throughout West Virginia, that the stereotype of West Virginians as being poor and uneducated has been made by and for rich people that have been exploiting the state of West Virginia for longer than a century. And my ancestors and my grandparents and my parents have been working for by and for the coal industry uh, for little to nothing my great grandfather died of black lung uh, and they had no access to education whatsoever i was barely able to attend west virginia university the only reason i had access to go there was because i was i had the ability um to apply for for scholarships west virginian scholarships that i could only use inside of the state of west virginia uh -huh. So th that's so important, right? Because if you're talking about scholarships that can be only used by West Virginians in West Virginia, then you're not just, you, you can't just say, well, go to another school. First of all, it's hard anyway, because a lot of people can't afford uh, not only the tuition, but the living costs in another state and those types of things. So you're actually, in effect, the image that comes to mind for me is blinders, right? Like on racehorses where you're just saying to the people of West Virginia, no, you can't look over there at the entire world that's represented by languages or the world of theory that's re represented by, uh, you know, math, the imagination of the mathematician or whatever. Uh, that to me is exactly what you said earlier, which is this kind of trying to, uh, what's, what's that word when the uh, cattle are, uh, you know, forced into that feeder thing, right? I mean, it's kind of like trying to take human beings and force them in, into that chute, uh, into the pen. And that seems to me, uh, you know, the word that comes to mind is sinister. Is this, I mean, George, uh, Gordon G. can't be an outlier in this. There have to be other people who, who uh, agree with this kind of treatment of uh, the people and the young people of West Virginia, he, right? I mean, somebody hired him, the board keeps him, uh, the state uh, got, uh, elected officials, I don't think they've condemned him or, uh, you know, what's the political context for somebody like that and decisions like these in West Virginia nowadays? So those who should be holding the WVU administrative administration accountable have been damningly silent. This includes the legislature of the state of West Virginia. This includes the West Virginia University Board of Governors. And this also includes all of our members of the United States Congress, which is, again, it, it's, it's tragic, it's scary, and it's almost as if they want this to happen. They need a workforce to stay in West Virginia to help them make money so that they can hoard it so that their children and grandchildren have access to these things, so that they can go to private universities to get education, so that they can travel the world, and so that their, their voices are able to be heard uh, internationally and nationally. Um, and meanwhile, West Virginians, we are stuck working in West Virginia in uh, those subjects that uh, the, align with the richest among us their preferences, um, and we will continue to do that until we die. So, uh, uh, you know, the 
a cheap labor seems like a, a one potential two-word answer to all this. So I'm looking at the list now, Maya, of of uh, programs being cut. So you've got biometric systems engineering. Guess they don't need that, or they don't want that from West Virginia. MA in higher education administration, special education. Wow. I mean, I, I look at that and I think. Uh, Okay, so the special needs kids of West Virginia, if you cut that program, you're cutting their futures right then and there. PhD in higher education, which you mentioned Gordon G has, my dad had one too, or rather EDD in higher education administration, which is also being cut. Art, history, music, performance, piano, jazz, pedagogy, piano, acting. So in other words, you know, what I, kind of what I tell take away from it is West Virginians don't dream. Don't don't think about helping kids in need. Don't think about you know, moving up in status in these particular fields. Don't think about the performing arts. Uh, we'll tell you what to think about. And I just wonder, you know, assuming that you agree that that's, and basically you've been saying that all along, uh, how, it must be very demoralizing for the students that are still there, for graduates like yourself, for people who in high school who had been hoping to go there and advance themselves. It must be very discouraging. Yes, it, it is. Um, again, we're essentially being told what we can and can't study, what we can and can't learn. Um, and presently, there is an appeals process in progress, um, though the proceedings are not accessible to the public or media, despite the profound public interest in the matter. And yesterday, WVU administrat administrative officials said during their campus conversation that programs appealing their preliminary recommendations could face further reductions. And so there will be further reductions down the line. This is not it. Uh, and the message is clear, you know, appeals about the reductions may result in more reductions. The reductions will continue until morale improves. Uh, and that is what President E. Gordon Gee is telling the people of West Virginia. The, the administration has, you know, since privated the video of this discussion. And we keep asking ourselves, how is this acceptable behavior to the WVU Board of Governors? How is this acceptable to the legislature? There is no shame or pretense left here. No, I 100% I, I agree, and I thank you for pointing that out. And one of the reasons that, I mean, this is inherently, because it's an inherent injustice, it's inherently important, just on its own. But I also think, you know, as you've suggested, that it is a kind of a canary in the coal mine as West Virginia is in so many ways, uh, for the rest of the country in, in terms of higher education. For example, you know, as you write, uh, uh, perhaps most perplexing, G re refuses to address what seems to be the root cause of WVU's budgetary crisis, the rapid withdrawal of state funding from the school. We've seen this in a lot of states, and yet he looks away. He says, you know, he cites increased costs, population decline, doesn't mention that state funding has dropped. Again, you know, seems to me, uh, oh, and then I'll give the quote, you also say, G refused to ask for an increase in state funding, claiming, quote, I've told this to the governor, I've told this to the president of the Senate, to the speaker, I'm not going to come and ask you for $45 million because it's a structural deficit, we have to solve that problem. That quote struck me, Maya, for a couple of reasons. Well, maybe three. One, it sounded like he had a predetermined deal that he wasn't going to ask for money, but that's just me, you know, seeing backroom dealings and everything, I could be wrong. But two, again, very ideological, uh, that why not ask for more money? You know, why not say that the coal barons, the Jim Justices and so on, uh, who are, you know, as the richest person in the West Virginia, as well as its governor, should pay a little more to help the young people of West Virginia. Uh, and then he used that phrase uh, that for me, people like me should come with a trigger warning, structural deficit, because to me that's code for 
you're on your own people we're not going to do anything to help you we're going to pretend it's a it's a force of nature and not a decision to appropriate wealth from people and uh you know leave you behind as we benefit ourselves with tax cuts and so on am i reading too much into it not at all e gordon gee and the west virginia university administration appear resolute not only in potentially jeopardizing the institution's financial health for personal gain but also in exerting pressure, belittling, marginalizing, and dismantling anyone who dares to oppose any of their actions. Um, the WV administration has played an active role in creating this crisis. Their proposal is the result of financial mismanagement, lack of institutional transparency, and an astonishing failure to recognize the power of education in transforming the lives of West Virginians. And, how, uh, you know, as we look at this, uh, uh, you know, so many of these decisions, whether in West Virginia or elsewhere, you know, you're a black West Virginian from a long West Virginia family. Uh, you know, the media narrative is well, it's white people, Trump country, right? Is a, as, as I think you've said elsewhere, you know, people are surprised to find uh, that there's outside of West Virginia, that there's such a thing as black Appalachians. Well, uh, the United Mine Workers, I think was maybe the first integrated union ever, many, many years, more than a hundred years ago. So there have been black people in West Virginia for a long time. Uh, where does, but they get left out of the narrative, right? I mean, they get, uh, I would argue uh, across the political spectrum, uh, you know, the so-called liberal media as well. And where does racism fit into all this? Because it seems to me that there's not only a contempt uh, or a dismissal of uh, poor people who want to get ahead of all races, but because uh, there are plenty of poor white people in West Virginia too, but that particular, I wonder to what extent racism in particular might play a role in all of this i mean i have been speaking with e gordon gee about racism and especially black student experience at west virginia university for years um and he has shown me that he especially does not care about black west virginians and our needs um in 2020 there was an anonymously released uh, document titled um I think it was titled like the Black Community's Concerns for West Virginia or Concerned Letter for, from the Black Community at West Virginia University. Um, and that went ignored by President Gee um, for months. He, he didn't answer my emails, even though prior to that, me being nationally recognized by various different scholarships that gave me the opportunity to be able to leave the United States and to leave West Virginia. He was more than happy to congratulate me on those uh, and to tell me to come back to West Virginia University in the future to teach and to tell my story. Um, but when it comes to anything about um, black and brown people being disadvantaged at WVU, he repeatedly has shown that that's not a priority for him. Um, the action groups were created following the receipt of that letter that ultimately ended up in nothing. It was all a ruse uh, and nothing has changed since then. Uh, and I think black students at WVU are going to be especially disadvantaged all this in all, the, all of this, um, considering the fact that um, black people in West Virginia are disproportionately um, affected by the opioid crisis. Um, we are less likely to... Um, uh, you know, but just a different bunch of different factors at play here. Um, and it, it just, it shows that uh, the administration's priorities aren't where they should be. And they don't care about the people of West Virginia, black, white, or otherwise. Um, and the, the conversation here should be on how this affects all of us and this affects all West Virginians. Uh, and we need to work together like the black and white coal miners uh, that were members of the, the UMW in West Virginia. We all need to work together for a common goal because our enemy is not each other. Our enemy is above us. Uh, and that is West Virginia University's president, Gordon Gee. Is it Gee, by the way, or G? It's Gee. 
G. Okay. So I've been mispronouncing it. Apologies to the highly well-paid Mr. G about that. Um, so uh, I guess in closing, what can uh, your, your, first of all, I highly recommend your piece to anyone in Slate. Uh, uh, and your uh, your name is spelled M Y I A Helm, which of course you know, but I'm saying it for you. Are you? And um, so I, I said yes. Didn't I say that? <laughs> two Y's. Yes, two Y's. Right, two Y's. I'm sure people will emphasize that extremely well written. So I encourage people to read that and also to reflect on. Uh, and look into what's happening with state universities and public education in their state. Uh, and of course, to track the situation with WVU, is there anything else people can do to stay uh, on top of this topic? Uh, of course, if, there, if you're listening from West Virginia, you can contact uh, your representatives your, your, uh, in, in the state government. Uh, anything else people can do to support the students and the faculty there? Yes. So I think it is also very important um, to ensure that people know the deception and the manipulation of numbers that the West Virginia University administration is doing. Um, the administration is mobilizing the reputations of other major research institutions like GW to justify these dangerous policies that will harm the students of West Virginia. They're manipulating figures regarding the number of individuals who will be impacted by these cuts. They claim only 7% of full-time faculty members will be affected, but this calculation includes all doctors within the West Virginia University Medical School. And the truth of the matter is that the current wave of cuts will affect 16% of full-time faculty members, and there will be further cuts in the future. Pertaining to students affected, West Virginia University said that this would impact only 2% of students, World Languages is currently teaching over 2,800 students this semester. That is nearly 12% of the students at West Virginia University, and that's only that department. And the figures that they continue to push exclusively count first-line majors, excluding second-line double majors, third majors, minors, and anyone taking individual courses in the affected programs. And the current leadership is clearly framing the cuts in this way to deflate opposite opposition. And this is not what transparency looks like in any by any means. They are coercing faculty and students to prevent them from speaking out against this. The, as mentioned in my Slate article, WVU is requiring all faculty to quote or to pledge, quote, accept and encourage change that is for the greater good and avoid conduct that reflects adversely on the image of the university, a requirement which the Foundation for Individual Rights and Expression describes as unconstitutionally vague. And Gordon Gee has also made a point to exclude WVU students from his academic dis transformation process. You know, he has said, students have told us very clearly that language is not a high priority. And by the way, languages is not a high priority nationally. And this is nothing but a lie. He has never listened to student concerns. He has never listened to faculty or staff concerns. And hundreds of students just staged a walkout to protest the proposed elimination of these academic programs. And it's hard for students to read the administration's recent announcement that the next item for review in the academic transformation will be more than 450 organizations that support student life is anything other than a thinly veiled threat. The WVU administration must be held accountable for these things that they're doing. Uh, and as I said, my personal essay, like West Virginians are trapped in the clutches of economic hardship. We are shackled to the state of West Virginia and we have no way of leaving except for our access to education. And if these cuts go through, we're the ones that will suffer the full weight of the West Virginia University administration's harrowing decisions. Extremely well said, and I have nothing to add to that. Again, my guest, Maya Helm, uh, she is a black labor historian uh, based in the United Kingdom, and her article in Slate is headlined uh, uh, West Virginia University. Everyone at West Virginia University knew something was up. I hate that we were right. Maya, thanks for writing this. Thanks for uh, fighting for the people of West Virginia. And thanks for coming on the program. Thank you. And we'll be right back after this. I'm Richard R.J. Escow, and this is The Zero Hour.